Hey everyone, this is Dr. Maples. Today we're going to get started on our second lecture series. Today we're going to start talking about what it is exactly that sociologists do. Now we're going to take a big idea, sociology, and we're going to break that into little pieces so we can understand it more clearly. We're going to talk about different kinds of sociology that we're going to talk about this semester. And in our follow-up lecture, we're also going to talk about what sociology students with a bachelor's degree coming out of EKU are doing in our community right now. So let's get started. First things first, I want to go back in time. I want to remind you some basic ideas from our previous lecture. Remember, sociology is very interested in the individual and their lived experience by all this stuff happening around them. Now, there's an idea called the sociological imagination, this idea by C. Wright Mills that individuals' biographies are shaped by the things happening around them, what we call history. Now, this idea is central to how we understand society and how we understand our field. We're very interested in studying this relationship, but also finding ways in which we can make sure individuals have the information they need to make better decisions. Or more clearly, make the decisions that are right for them. Now, we want to begin thinking about how, in different ways, society might come into play in our decision-making process. In fact, we'll talk about that some in a couple of the different fields that we'll mention today. Next, we want to remember what we mean by sociology. Now, sociology is a very diverse field. In fact, we'll find out how diverse in just a moment. That covers almost anything that you could be interested in ranging from the sociology of sports to the sociology of rock climbing to the sociology of poverty, of illness, of families, anything out there that interests you, there's a field of sociology that studies it. Likewise, remember that sociologists have two commitments that they return to time and time again. The first one is that we observe society. And by observe society, we mean that we take notes on it, we study it, we examine it, we try to understand how it works. Second, we try to improve things where we can. Our end goal is for individuals to have the information that they need to make the decision that's right for them, rather than making the decision that's presented to them as the obvious choice. Now, when I mention that sociology is a big idea, what we want to do is break that into some chunks today. In fact, we're going to talk about several kinds of sociology that we'll talk about this semester in our class. So let's get started on that. Now our first one is honestly one of my favorites, although it's not technically what my field is. That would be cultural sociology. This is the study of how culture, the way of life for a group of people, shapes our individual experiences. Now I will often talk about how I'm a first generation college student and also Appalachian. And these are very important formative experiences for me because I realize as an Appalachian, I had a very different perspective on how the world operates, on things like power, on things like the value of education and the importance of faith that were very different from people from other places. In fact, that's become one of my favorite things is to try to understand how people from different cultures see the world ever so slightly differently. And I often think about how if I'd been born into a different culture, how might that have shaped my individual experience? How might that have made my life a little easier or a little more difficult? It's an important idea. In fact, we can think about how things like culture cause people to maybe treat us differently or to understand us differently. We could think about, for example, how certain cultures might be considered um, less desirable, such as Appalachians are often accused of being uncultured or uneducated. Well, it's intriguing because Appalachians often don't favor education in the same way that other cultures might. It's something that I saw back home. How might those decisions, though, shape how we see the world? Again, does this change people's decisions coming out of high school, or maybe choosing to leave high school, about what they're going to want when they graduate? Likewise, could it change how you see the world? In fact, could something like not having a college degree shape your political perspective, or your moral compass, or the decisions that you feel are maybe right and wrong? This is the realm of cultural sociology. It's a fascinating realm. We'll spend two weeks there. We'll also have a time to, to explore a little bit about Appalachian culture along the way. Another one that interests me, and it's the field that, again, isn't mine, but this is the one that brought me into sociology as an undergrad, is the field of social psychology. 
Social psychology is the study of how we as individuals are socialized. It takes the best of both worlds, so to speak, of sociology and psychology. Psychology, a field that studies the individual mind. Sociology, ex realizing that there's a whole bunch of individual minds, and we have to understand how they interact with each other as well. With social psychology, we look at socialization, how we learn certain norms. So check this out. How did you learn to wait in line? Think about that for a moment. Where did you learn to wait in line? Who taught you that? Was there a book? Was it a YouTube video that you watched when you were nine? Somebody should so do that YouTube video. Send me a link if you find it. How did we learn to wait in line? We learned it by watching others. We probably watched our parent or our sibling or someone around us or just watching total strangers. And we learned over time what was appropriate and inappropriate for waiting in line. That's socialization. And that's a case of the individual being shaped by the things happening around them. You see how that works? It's exciting, it's extraordinary, it's fabulous. With socialization, we also learn crazy things like when it's an appropriate time to kiss someone. Maybe even there's been some unsureness. You have that moment where like, do I shake this person's hand? Do I hug them? What do I do? Well, even that, we've kind of been taught how we sort of make a joke out of it if we don't know what to do and we shake hands very vigorously and everything kind of, you know, everyone laughs and it's kind of okay. That's socialization too. In fact, that's saving face, something that we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. We can even think too about how our social experiences are shaped by the things that we might be allowed or not allowed to play with as kids. Maybe you are allowed to play with construction equipment or uh, building equipment or guns or um, soldier toys like I was, G.I. Joes and violent things like Transformers. That was the stuff that I was socialized on as a kid and I always thought that was really strange because my sister didn't play with those things. In fact, she was interested in dolls. So it was a very different lived experience. Now, it could just be that those were the things you played with and that's it, but what if that somehow shapes your world? What if we somehow found that our society was encouraging um, young females to be moms rather than to be construction workers? And would they accept females as construction workers? Do you see how that works? It's exciting. Social psychology is a great field to help you think about you as an individual and your experiences and how we learn so much about ourselves even from other people. Now stratification and inequality is a very large section. We'll spend about two weeks on this one. We'll also spend two weeks on culture and about two weeks on socialization. But stratification and inequality tries to understand differences in terms of resources, uh, the opportunities that you have available to you. Um, we try to understand how an individual, um, because of the things that are available to them, might make different decisions. One of the things that I'm aware of with my students is that I know students coming from Eastern Kentucky, students coming from poor households, are far more apt to drop out of college. Likewise, simply being from Central Appalachia means that you have a strong interest in taking care of your family. And there may be a social expectation that you leave college to take care of a sick family member. These are things where the individual is having their experience shaped by the stuff happening around them. Likewise, too, I find with many of my students at colleges, both here and anywhere, that the bulk of them come from well-to-do households. Now, is that because children from less well-off households decide at an early age they don't want to go to college? Sociologists would argue that maybe they make that decision because college isn't discussed with them. Or maybe they don't have people around them that are saying, hey, you should consider going to college. That was something for me. I didn't really have people around me who were college students uh, and neither of my parents had gone to college. So I didn't really have an experience to talk about that. Think about how those things might shape your experiences. We'll spend a lot of time thinking about how resources are an important part of our daily lives and what we decide to do or maybe decide not to do. We'll also spend some time looking at rural and urban sociology. These are two fields that are very near and dear to my heart. Urban sociology tries to understand how living in a city offers different experiences from living in a rural area. A rural area would be uh, where you have low population density, probably more cows than there are people. That's always a good rule for determining if you're in a rural area. 
but we'll understand how living in a particular place both now and in the past might shape the things that you decide to do. In fact, one of the things that we'll try to understand is poverty by place. We'll try to understand why we see concentrated inner city poverty and what that means to live in that space. In the same breath as we try to figure out what it means to live in places like Lee County or Owlsley County here in eastern Kentucky in rural poverty and how that too may shape your experiences. These are two of my favorite sections and between them we'll spend about three and a half weeks on them. Likewise, and very relevant to the moment, we'll be talking about social epidemiology. Social epidemiology is the study of how society shapes illness and our decisions that we choose to do or not do because of illnesses. It's going to be an exciting time because we're kind of in the middle of a global pandemic right now. And so we'll be thinking about how COVID-19 relates to our society and decisions that may or may not be made by individuals. Social epidemiology is an extraordinary field right now for sociologists. We have a lot of students who get sociology bachelor degrees and then move on to get public health masters or social uh, epidemiology masters and so forth to work in communities right here in eastern Kentucky helping to address social problems like addiction and uh, poverty and more. It's a very exciting field. It's also a great one if you're training to be a nurse and you find that you probably don't want to be a nurse because of blood or being exposed to other people's feces and urine and blood and so forth. Social epidemiology is a great field for you to put your interest in medicine um, in a more applied setting where you're in an office rather than working face to face with a patient. A couple of things that we'll talk about with social epidemiology is talking about Eastern Kentucky's horrible, horrible health. We're going to talk about our heart attack rates. We're going to talk about diabetes here. We're going to talk about hepatitis C and HIV. In fact, these are two illnesses that are now surging and increasing in pop popularity is the wrong word, frequency in our region. In fact, we'll talk about HIV, something that appears in the late 70s to early 80s, but actually had been present for much longer. We'll talk more about that then that appears in the United States and completely changes how we understand things like contagion in the United States. It also was an extraordinary time, something that I as a child lived through that generation. And so I'll share some of my personal frightening experiences hearing about this as like a six and seven year old kid. We'll also study too how sociologists were engaged in social epidemiology and that HIV crisis to also understand what that might mean for COVID going forward. Now, as our last section, this is one that we don't specifically talk about because it's going to pop up in multiple sections. Applied sociology is what I do. I'm interested in studying how sociology can be helpful to communities. Applied sociologists are thinkers who are engaged with local communities to help them identify problems that they see, not that I choose. I don't come in and say, hey, you have a problem. I work with them to identify the problems that they see. And then based on research, based on theories, based on very clear policy decisions and what's worked in the past in other places, I can provide suggestions about what you might do to address those problems. As a person, right now, I'm working all throughout the Red River Gorge, Eastern Kentucky, trying to help with our transitional economy as we figure out what happens now that coal mining does not seem to be recovering. And since we can't get our manufacturing sector to develop like we wanted to, what are we going to do in that place? What are we going to do instead? That's the kind of work that I'm trying to do. In fact, that's one of the reasons that I study outdoor recreation and uh, rock climbing's economic impact, because it's a valuable idea for our region, and it could help in other places too. Now, as applied sociologists, we're very much engaged with our communities, but I'm here to say that sociology majors with bachelor degrees fall into this category and right now they're doing extraordinary things for communities both here and across the united states and globe they're also great paying jobs now i'm going to stop here for now with our next lecture we're going to talk a little bit more about what my sociology majors are doing give you some ideas about the kinds of jobs that they're looking at if you got questions you feel free to write me i'm happy to help anytime we'll talk soon